Farm Ecology friends, what is up? It is Dr. Bernoski, and I want to talk to you about benzodiazepines. So once you understand anxiety and the state and trait anxiety, as long as we remember that there is also a spectrum of different anxieties, uh, that will help us understand what benzodiazepine is best for treatment. Um, so this is just a little bit of history. And one thing I do want to point out is that this is a class of drugs that does have a relatively wide therapeutic index. That means that the dose that is needed for effectiveness in 50% of the population is very far away from the dose that causes toxic or even lethal side effects in 50% of the population. So our therapeutic index is very wide. Another thing that is useful about benzodiazepines is that they have a very good outcome. So 75% of users show at least moderate improvements to very marked improvements. So if we think about that, that's three out of four patients that have improvement with the use of these wide uh, safety spectrum benzodiazepines. The side effects that we see are mild, they're transient, but you do have to keep in mind, as these are GABA drugs, you cannot discontinue safely a GABA drug because of the overall functionality of GABA in the physiology. So let's just go over that really quickly. Uh, we have many pathways in our neurophysiology, and we think about the dopaminergic system, serotonergic system, um, as some, you know the the pathways for happiness and pleasure. Uh, but I also want you to keep in mind that all of these systems are overlaid with these large inhibitory and excitatory pathways, and the main excitatory neurotransmitter we have in the body is our glutamate, and the main inhibitory neurotransmitter is GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. And what you can see here in this picture very simply is that when GABA is released from a presynaptic neuron, or really any neuron, it's going to bind to its receptors, which in this picture are postsynaptic, typical ligand-gated channels. So in this case, our ligand is GABA, GABA binds, it allows a pore channel to open, and when that pore channel opens, we have the influx of chloride into the postsynaptic neuron. When there is an influx of negative ions into the postsynaptic neuron, it becomes hyperpolarized, excessively negative, which means it's very difficult to then get up to the charge necessary for threshold and thus an action potential. So GABA has an overall inhibitory calming effect on general brain activity. So we take a look at these Kind of tetrameric receptors, we've got five subunits in most GABA receptors. So these are an ion pore. So these are our simplest type of receptors. So we have multiple subunits, they're linked together. Um, these are globular proteins. So even though we look at these pictures of them looking really nice, um, inserted into membranes and traversing the surface, uh, they are globular in nature. So they do change conformation quite quickly. And that's useful for us in pharmacology because that means when there is a movement in these globular proteins that will expose binding sites so that things can bind. And then when there's a conformational or shape change, those substances will dissociate. So they don't stay bound forever. They bind and then unbind. It's the constant type of interaction. So alpha-1 uh, subunits are part of this receptor. There's also beta subunits, and then there's gamma subunits. GABA itself naturally binds between alpha and beta subunits. Benzodiazepines are selective to bind between the alpha and the GABA or gamma receptor subunits. Again, uh, what that means is that this site is separate from where a GABA site would be. So that means these are non-competitive drugs. They're not competing for the same site as the endogenous substrate. So in the simplistic sense, um, benzodiazepines, they, again, they're not going to bind to the GABA site. GABA can still bind. Benzodiazepines have their own specific site between the GABA, or I keep saying GABA, gamma and the, and the beta. Well, no, alpha subunits. That's even written here, and I can't even read it. So this is a GABA-A receptor, and things that bind to the GABA-A receptor are typical 
benzodiazepines, things that bind to the GABA B receptor we call atypical benzodiazepines. So that's a simple way to remember it, atypical B atypical. Okay, so here we have a benzodiazepine binding to its specific slot between the alpha and gamma subunits. We have the same endogenous substrate action as there is with GABA. GABA binds, opens channel, lets in chloride. Benzodiazepines do the same way. They bind, the pore opens, and then chloride goes down its concentration gradient and then reaches the inside of the cell and hyperpolarizes it. All right, so now I'm going to blow your mind with a <laughs> groundbreaking animation of this. So we say that benzodiazepines are facilitative of GABA function, meaning that they enhance GABA activity. So whenever there's general brain excitation, we get GABA facilitation because GABA is going to quiet down neurons. In a brain that's a typical, neuro, um, we call them neurotypical brains, normative um, non-atypical brains. Um, in something like abnormal firing that would lead to a seizure, we would have the facilitation of GABA. GABA is produced and it kind of quiets down neurons in the associated area so that there's not a spread of something like seizure activity or just a general over-excitation. So here we're going to have an action potential traveling down, boom, the presynaptic terminal. And when the action potential arrives at the very end of the neuron, it's gone all the way down the length of the axon, that's going to now trigger voltage-gated calcium channels to open. And when calcium enters the cell, that drives vesicular docking and fusion. And when vesicles filled with substrate fuse and dock at the cleft, that means they're going to empty out their contents through exocytosis into the synaptic cleft. So that's what you see here. GABA is now diffusing into the synaptic cleft where it will be attracted to its binding site. So GABA binds to its two specific sites. So there we have GABA binding. And then we have a pore channel opening. So ligand-gated ionotropic receptors. GABA binds. Then we have chloride boom, go into our postsynaptic cell. Negative ion, going to lower the charge, make it very difficult to generate an action potential because we're much further away from the threshold potential. And remember, the threshold potential is the charge at which the voltage-gated channels open along the length of the axon so that we can actually traffic the message down for the vesicles to dock and fuse. So let's watch that one more time, a little bit faster without me talking. Okay, so action potential, boom. Calcium influx, because that's a voltage-gated channel, vesicular docking infusion, exocytosis of GABA, GABA binds to its postsynaptic receptors, opens up the pore channel, chloride then moves into the postsynaptic cell, reducing excitability and reducing the chance of an action potential. Where we hope and where we believe this is having the most functionality is in a part of the limbic system referred to as the amygdala. There are two in normotypative brains, um, amygdala, and amygdala is Latin for almond. They look like two little almonds and they feed forward into this uh, corpus striatal structure that we'll talk about in greater detail in subsequent lectures. But the amygdala is really important for things like fear processing. So in this picture, you see somebody looking at a snake. It looks kind of evil. They are apparently wearing a monocle and they can see the snake really well with that monocle. So typically you have sensory information, uh, make its first stop at the thalamus, and then it's relayed to the places that it needs to go. That's why we call it thalamic relay. So in normal responses, sensory information, see a snake with your monocle, you're like, oh no, because you get a direct input to the amygdala, which is then going to put forth a sympathetic response. Remember, in an anxiety disorder, we have a sympathetic response when there is no direct threat to the safety of that person's body, <coughs> excuse me, or their ego. General side effects of benzodiazepines are really straightforward. The first one is anxiolysis. That means the breaking down of anxiety. That's why we call these anxiolytic drugs. That's straightforward. And then in a dose-dependent fashion, the higher the dose, the more sedating they are. Um, because of the GABA overlay I mentioned, um, these have anticonvulsant effects because GABA has a general hyperpolarizing effects. 
so that we don't have uh, spreading excitability and seizure activity. And when you get to really high levels, you can use these also to treat things like spasticity. Um, so they're used as muscle relaxants. So if I asked you to spot a benzodiazepine, which I probably will, you can tell if it ends in a PAM or LAM that it's most likely a benzodiazepine. There's always going to be things that break the rules, like our first uh, compound ever made, sold as Librium now, chlorodiazepoxide, that does not end in PAM or LAM, but you might see the diaza in there, which diazepam is one of the top three most common benzodiazepines. And then we have chlorazepate, sold as transine. So those are a little bit different. So those you'll honestly just have to memorize. But the first one ever created was chlorodiazepoxide, sold as Librium. And then chlorazepate is very similar, sold as transine. And these people are on some Xanax. They're taking their one mig, which is a you know relatively standard dose. And look how happy and awesome they look because they are taking their benzodiazepines and they have no anxiety about hanging out without shirts on. Also remember that even though benzodiazepines all have the same mechanism of action, they're going to bind to the benzocyte, they're going to allow chloride influx and hyperpolarize postsynaptic neurons, they have a really large differentiation between one another just because of the pharmacokinetic properties. So some of these are going to be very short acting and some of them long acting. So that's something I want you to pay attention to. So when we start looking at these different medications, you'll see that some of these uh, have different ways of being given. So IV, IV, IM, IV, other ones can be given just oral. So you're looking at route of administration, dose equivalency, how long it takes for onset of effects, INT meaning intermediate effects. There's really fast acting ones and then there's slow acting ones. Um, we have our half-life, to distribution, so how long it gets to be distributed into all of the body tissues. So it could have a fast onset, meaning you feel the effects right away, but it might not be an equal concentration in all the body tissues. Then we have our elimination half-life, which is how long it takes for 50% of the drug to leave the body. So some take a really long time to leave and some have a very short time. Active metabolites. Remember, metabolites are just byproducts of drug breakdown. When drugs are metabolized by the liver, those byproducts are called metabolites, which are either active or inert. And inert means that they have no biologic function. Inert compounds would be non-active metabolites, and those would just be modifications to the drug to make it water-soluble so that it can be excreted. However, when a drug has an active metabolite, it means that that byproduct has a similar action to the drug, so it continues the length of that drug's action. So chlorodiazepoxide, we see that its elimination half-life is quite long. That's because it has an active metabolite. Let's look over here. Chlorazepate, quite long. Well, look, it's got an active metabolite. Same thing with diazepam, active metabolite. The ones with really quick elimination half-lives, no active metabolite. So when you're just looking at just... You can even look at a pill bottle, and when you look at the insert that comes with the medication, it will say whether or not there's active or inactive metabolites. That tells you a lot about how long the action will last in the body. That is just the rule. Active metabolites last much longer. It's a nice way of prolonging the action of the drug. If you want a short-acting medication, let's say if somebody has difficulties with primary insomnia, they have difficulty falling asleep, you don't want to give them something that lasts really long because then they'll be drowsy in the morning. So you want something really fast. So that means if it has an active metabolite listed, that's going to last a long time and they're going to feel drowsy in the morning. Okay, so... When we think about the pharmacokinetic differences between benzodiazepines, we have to consider then if they have a long half-life, and I'm talking about elimination half-life versus a short one. So long half-life drugs, benzodiazepines, good things about them is that you don't have to take as many of them, so less frequent dosing. You don't have any rebound, and remember rebound means it's worse now than it was before. So if you had a patient get their benzo, then they feel less. 
So let's look at anxiety levels. So they're super anxious and then they take their benzo and their anxiety levels go down. And then they're between doses and now their anxiety is going to peak. And then they're given the drug and their anxiety decreases a little bit. So see that difference where the anxiety is higher now than it was before? That's called rebound. So interdose rebound means between doses. So there's no rebound effect when they're long acting because it lasts a long time. And also long acting drugs, there's less severe withdrawal because they have a long course of action in the body and the body is used to the levels of it, which are usually lower um, in milligram, uh, like potency wise than a short acting drug. The cons of these is that because they last so long in the body is that they accumulate. Meaning if we are now looking at the dose in the plasma, so somebody takes one every day, that means every day there's a little bit of, you know, escalation in the dose because when you take your next pill, you're going to be adding on to any drug that's currently in the body. This shouldn't be that big of a problem for people with healthy livers and kidneys for excretion, but those with altered metabolism due to liver abnormalities, kidney abnormalities, that will be a problem. That also is going to lead to having like a two week washout period after switching medications because there's some residual drug left over and you'll have to wait for those plasma levels to return to zero. Okay, short acting benzodiazepines, bad things. Well, you have to take them a lot. So more frequent dosing, that's called a pill burden. Oh no, interdose rebound, that's bad. We don't like that. More severe withdrawal, that's terrible. That can be life-threatening. However, the pro is that there's no accumulation. They're in the body for a short amount of time and then there's none. And then two days later when somebody has another panic attack, standard levels, it goes up, it goes down. So if you're thinking also not just about um, whether or not you want to avoid drowsiness or things of that nature, if the person, the patient has an abnormality with metabolism, with kidneys, with the liver in general, uh, short acting or short half-life benzodiazepines are not going to accumulate and not cause any deleterious effects because of just plasma accumulation. Okay, just really quickly, metabolism, we have discussed phase one and phase two in class. And we know that phase one is usually really quick reactions like hydroxylation to make the drug um, water soluble. Phase two reactions are when they are coupled with something so that they can be excreted by the body. So when you look here, remember, we have our cytochrome P450 enzymes. So there's a whole bunch of them. So that is another good thing about these drugs. We can choose a lot of different uh, types of drugs based on what people are taking. So if they're, that's why it's important to check their other medications. So here's like a 3A4. That means you might need to avoid certain foods if they're on like diazepam or nordiazepam. So luckily, there's a whole host of other benzos, alprazolam, triazolam. So because they all use different cytochrome P450s, we can uh, try our best to avoid any drug interactions. Um, lorazepam and oxazepam are only by glucuronidation. So if you follow them through the picture, like, I don't even see them on here. Where are they? Oxazepam is on here somewhere. I am not going to put on my reading glasses because I am in denial that I need them because I am young and fresh. So just know that we don't even need to worry about, um, you know, phase one reactions. So that means they're less affected by age or liver disease and lorazepam, oxazepam, great choice of drugs for elderly. Because as you might remember, glucuronides are the thing that lasts the longest in the body. So as you can see, all of these, they're going to be modified in some way, either a first, there's lorazepam, I found it. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Okay, lorazepam, see, there's nothing in between. It just goes and binds or is, um, you know, conjugated with glucuronide so that it can be excreted. See that? Elimination. Magic. So phase one, most of them are hydroxylation. There's a little alkylation in there, hydroxylation. Here's an acetylation. Um, but all of them eventually, besides clonazepam, are going to be coupled with glucuronides so that they can be excreted.
other things that benzos are useful for. So preoperative sedation, they have uh, sedation dentistry now. Insomnia, we'll talk about that in class. You're going to love learning about that. Restless leg syndrome, when the legs feel like they're creepy and they have to be uh, flexed. Uh, forms of muscle spasms, muscle tension, spasticity, epilepsy, alcohol withdrawal. That's the safest way to withdraw somebody off of alcohol so they don't go into what we call the delirium tremens and also catatonia. So they're very useful drugs. Because they are GABA drugs in general, you do have to keep in mind that they are sedating. One other fun thing about benzodiazepines, lots of drugs are this way, including a lot of um, just simple... Uh, vitamins that people take. They are designed to be degraded at a very specific stomach pH. If you don't know your pHs, a normal stomach, like gastric juice pH, should be between one and a half to three. That would be a normal gastric pH. The pH in the body, remember, is 7.4. These drugs are designed to be taken when you have normal, predictable stomach pHs. That means if people are taking antacids, so they're taking Tums, um, so antacids with like aluminum and magnesium, those are things like your Maalox, your Philips. Those are, they're interesting because one, one causes um, laxative effects, the other one causes constipation. So they mix them together and call it Maalox and hope for the best. And they make people feel good in the meantime because what they do is neutralize stomach acid so that there's a nice high pH in the stomach and you don't have any heartburn that you feel. And you feel you can eat corn dogs and this tummy's like, hooray, I'm not burning. However, if somebody takes a benzodiazepine and they take a Tums, the stomach pH will be altered. So the active drug cannot be broken off of its backbone. Oh no, if you're popping Tums all day and your stomach pH is five, guess what? that's not going to be able to react in the stomach acid. So unfortunately, that is something that we should take into account. If somebody is taking them, especially every day, they have to avoid things like bicarbonate substances or any of these like magnesium drugs, aluminum drugs, Maalox, Tums, Pepto-Bismol. They do increase the pH of the stomach and then prevent the liberation of the active drug compound from the inert substances. Again, because these are GABA drugs, they do cause hyperpolarization of neurons. When they're taken at the correct dose, they are going to be concentrated in their action and somewhere you can't see because this is the outside of the brain. This is the cortex. Latin facts, cortex is Latin for bark. Not like the bark of a dog, the bark of a tree. So your cortex is what covers things. So your cortex, that's here. Um, that's all this wrinkly stuff, those gyri and salsi. The amygdala structures are deep in the brain. Um, so ideally, they're going to have their main focus of action in these limbic centers, but they're also going to have general disinhibitory functions um, elsewhere in the brain. So they are relatively sedating. Again, this is dose dependent. So the higher the dose, the higher the sedation. Um, there has been shown in laboratory tests that people have difficulty when they're taking these medications um, making new memories. That's called anterograde amnesia. That means going forward, which is different than retrograde amnesia, which is being unable to remember things from the past. Um, and other cognitive functions in laboratory tests are blunted, like memory or different cognitive tasks where people have to gamble or um, solve complicated puzzles. They also, because GABA, GABA is a, something that's affected by alcohol as well, so you have to think about it that way. If you have a really high dose, it would be like drinking six beers and then going out into the world. So you're more likely to fall. People drive faster when they are that disinhibited. Um, when you drive faster, you're more likely to get into an accident. There is, unfortunately, some clinical data that shows that individuals taking benzodiazepines chronically are more likely to develop depression. Um, and we will talk more because anxiety and depression have a really intricate overlay with one another. So that isn't that surprising when you're um, altering one system with a GABA that we're uh, also altering another system that is highly intertwined. The only one that doesn't show that in clinical retrospective studies is alprazolam. 
So if somebody has a proneness to depression or depressive-like symptoms, Alprazolam is the choice for them. All righty. Okay, so this is just a little bit of data about um, benzodiazepines and depression. This is a really small study um, from 1989, but take it as you will. Uh, 30 people, they were taking lorazepam for panic disorder. Um, when you look at those 30 people, eight developed major depression, which out of 30 is, is a big amount. It was only in nine months. However, interestingly, four of those eight already had a past history of major depressive disorder and one of dysthymia, which we'll talk about in the depression chapter, which is not major depression. It's low level depression that lasts for a long time. So of again, of these eight, four had a history of major depressive, one of mild depression, four improved with reducing the dose of their benzo. The other four, so because it was eight, four plus four, they did require an adjunct of a tricyclic antidepressant. And we'll learn about those in a little bit. Um, just remember these are GABA drugs. Withdrawing from GABA does cause a lot of deleterious effects. Um, so you can see relapse, you can see rebound, you can see withdrawal symptoms. Um, and again, this is going to be similar to the withdrawal you see with alcohol. So there is a tapering protocol that you will have to be familiar with if you're prescribing these medications, or if you're advising patients about their medications, they should not abruptly stop the drugs because of chances of seizure activity and the withdrawal syndrome. So the full withdrawal syndrome is here. So you're now removing GABA facilitation. So now you've got glutamate and everything is trying to regulate itself. And it takes two to three weeks for neuronal compensation to occur so that there is homeostasis within the brain after being on drugs for a long time. So feeling confused, like clouded senses, heightened sensory perception, abnormal taste and smell, paresthesias, Again, think about uh, the fact that these are muscle uh, relaxants. So the opposite's going to happen. Muscle cramps, twitching, blurry vision, diarrhea, decreased appetite, weight loss. So this can be avoided, hopefully, with a very strict tapering protocol that slowly removes somebody from the drug. There's also severe withdrawal syndrome, and it's very similar to what you would see with delirium tremens. You can check out this entire list here of severe withdrawal. Um, you should, whenever you see things like hallucinations or delirium, um, hallucinations are seeing, hearing things that you know are not real, um, but might believe that they are. And the same thing kind of goes with delirium. There's like hallucinations and there's beliefs, like delusions. Delusions are beliefs that are not real, but might be believed to be real. Okay, it is more likely that there's severe withdrawal the longer somebody is on the drug. So here's your rules for real life. So long-term treatment, higher doses, higher potency. So the stronger the drug, shorter half-lives. And again, the one that you can control uh, most readily in preparation for this is abrupt discontinuation by using this tapering. Okay. All right. One thing just to keep in mind with drug schedules, which we haven't talked about a ton. So we'll do a little bit of that in class. The schedule of benzos is schedule four, which means that they have a medically approved use. Obviously they do. They have about a million uses. Uh, they have a moderate abuse liability. They can have written or telephone prescription with refills. That's different than higher schedule drugs where uh, in schedule two, there's no refills. Schedule one, you can't get it because you'll get arrested if you have it without a lab um, and drug license. Uh, whereas like schedule five, you don't need a prescription. Those are over the counter. So this is the level right before over the counter. So we consider these medications quite safe and even trust people with refills. Um, when people use a drug for an, its unintended purpose, which could be just for fun, that's technically abuse rather than taking it for a panic disorder. Um, it is more common when people have access to it. So I mentioned that um, like Valium or diazepam was one of the three most common. Okay, so we've got diazepam, which is Valium, Alprazolam is Xanax, and Lorazepam is Ativan. Those are the three most popular in the United States. Well, these are the drugs that are abused most frequently. Well, that makes sense. These are the three that are around. 
which means they're going to be the three that are most highly abused. Also, this is a lot um, higher to find abuse in individuals who have issues with um, alcohol abuse than for people without alcohol abuse. So the abuse liability is higher in alcoholics. Um, so it's important to screen for drinking levels, not just so that you can caution people about doses, but also to try to do some predictive analysis about abuse potential. Uh, these are generally sedating drugs, so they're CNS depressants, which means it doesn't make you sad. It means it hyperpolarizes neurons. So anything else that increases CNS depression should not be mixed with benzos. So alcohol and other sedative hypnotics. So those include things for sleep. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll stop there right now. <laughs> sleep. Okay. Um, there's also some drugs that increase benzodiazepine levels in the bloodstream. Cimetidine is one of them. We'll talk about that in a later chapter. That increases levels of diazepam. Um, Alprazolam, triazolam. Also, carbamazepine is a drug that decreases benzodiazepine levels, so you're not getting your full therapeutic dose. Again, the good things about them, they've been around for a long time. They have a high therapeutic index. There's relatively low drug interactions. You just have to remember... Also, the general rule about your, um, your bicarbonate substances, so your gastric acid neutralizing drugs. Other good thing, there is also an antagonist, flumazenil or rumazicon as it's sold. Here's a little tip for you, farm tip of the day. If it is all lowercase, that's the generic name. If there is a capital letter, that's its trait name. So if somebody took too much, guess what? There is actually an antagonist to that. So great. That means they can be saved with an antidote. And there's your therapeutic window. Nice wide one with benzos. Okay, other treatments for um, anxiety. Some other medications we'll talk about soon. We've got buspirone, sold as buspar. It has nothing to do with benzodiazepines. Like a lot of other medications, we're not super sure how it works. We know that it binds to the serotonin type 1a receptor, but um, yeah, we don't know that it that its mechanism of action has anything to do with anything, but we do know that it works in generalized anxiety disorder. It's not super helpful in panic disorder, but it is available. Um, so if you're worried about addictive liability or you know fall risk, buciparone is there, or buciparone, sorry, antidepressants. So we'll talk about those next. Antidepressants include three different classes of drugs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the tricyclic antidepressants, and the monoamine oxide inhibitors. And those drugs are all going to have some sort of effect on serotonin, also norepinephrine, um, and then we'll see that some other ones, they're weird drugs. So some will have dopamine effects, some will have histamine effects. Um, some of these, not all of them. SSRIs are really straightforward. But anyways, because there's such an interplay between anxiety and depression, we do find that drugs for depression seem to relieve symptoms of anxiety and then vice versa. Antihistamines, uh, if anxiety is really high at night, um, that's a great first step. They, it works really quickly. It's sedative or it sedates you really easily. And it's um, definitely non-habit forming. Antihistamines, first generation, remember first. Second generations are not um, sedating drugs. So things like your Benadryl, they make you tired. They have a quick onset of action and they're not addictive. Beta blockers work oppositely. Um, than something like here, let's wait for your anxiety to peak and then give you a drug to lower it. Remember beta blockers, they're gonna lower, um, like if heart rate is 80, beta blockers lower it to like 60. So if the trigger for somebody's anxiety is to get up to a heart rate of 100 and you have a resting heart rate, if it was at 80, well, you might get there easy. But now if you're at 60, you might not even reach that panic disorder threshold. Uh, clonidin works similarly. Clonidin, that's different than clonopin, which you saw in a couple slides earlier. Clonopin with a K, clonopin, that's a benzodiazepine. Clonidin is an alpha-2 drug. Alpha-2 receptors are embedded in the smooth muscle, uh, vascular tissue, so alpha-2, so you get vasodilation. So in the same way, instead of resting heart rate, you're lowering the blood pressure, so you have to 
have a really strong influence on the physiology to have a panic attack. There's a lot further for it to go. Um, so again, it's treating it a little bit opposite. So these cardiac drugs, these are really gaining popularity in the anxiety world because they work on a lot of different spectrums of anxiety besides generalized and panic. And then finally, we have teagabin, which was originally developed to be an anticonvulsant. So you see GABA like right in here. Teagabin is a medication that uh, just increases GABA. It's a really strong medication and it's been used now successfully for anxiety and also for bipolar disorder by increasing GABA. But it, it was originally developed as an anticonvulsant. It still uses that, but it definitely in lower doses is very effective for anxiety and bipolar Finally, let's just end with some homeopathic remedies. Uh, these are things that you would obviously not need a prescription for, but have very similar mechanism of action. Um, just remember that the deal with things that are supplements, it means that they don't have to go through FDA testing. So you can find independent research on these with dose response curves, um, but we don't have for, especially for each company, because there's a lot of them. There's not a lot of information about what's in here and what dose would be adequate um, per the plant used and substance used. So kava, kava is a plant, and kava has been taken for a long time, for centuries, and it's been made into a tea, and it can also be put it into a capsule by grinding up these leaves and then taken by mouth. So it's sold to treat anxiety disorders. Um, again, because it's very variable with what you'll find in here. So this just says 60, 60 megs of cavalectones per capsule. What does that mean? We don't know. That means you take the pills until you feel better. So it's a very, very, very variable amount of drug. So here you have 60 capsules and there's 60 in each. That means they might be taking five to six a day. That's a lot of drug. Um, they work, though, the same mechanism of action as a benzodiazepine. They are likely GABA-A agonists. So that means they're going to have um, the similar drug interactions. So they're vasodilatory, so you get headaches, dizziness, visual disturbances. They are also additive with other CNS depressants. When you have a patient with Parkinson's, and they do treat people with Parkinson's for anxiety related to their disorder and depression also, but L-DOPA, the cornerstone therapy for Parkinson's, if the patient takes kava with L-DOPA, their Parkinsonian symptoms get worse. So you definitely do not want to mix kava with L-DOPA. Just keep in mind, just because it's sold over the shelves, well, so is Tylenol and so is ibuprofen. That doesn't mean that it's not a drug. It's still going to have a mechanism of action. It will still have interactions. Um, and then there's also valerian root, which works very similarly. It's also GABA-A, very, very variable doses as well. So it's sold for insomnia, anxiety, general stress. Again, the doses are huge, so it's a ton of drug. You're never going to get a dose that's as high as you would with any medication than you would with a prescription. That's just the way life works. It's always going to be stronger with a prescription. Uh, so at bedtime, 200 to 500 mg. So that, like, that's a lot of these pills. Um, 200 to 300 mg twice a day for anxiety. That's even more of those pills. Again, they're GABA-A. They're going to have the same adverse reactions, drug interactions. So I want you to think about ways that you might get your patients to disclose their herbal medications, including supplements and vitamins, because they are drugs. So if it's something that's added to the intake sheet, or you have a separate page for vitamins and minerals, keep in mind these are drugs and you want to know what people are taking so you can put that into your interaction checker and make sure you're not going to kill anybody. This is the simplest question I have ever read to you or anybody else. I hope you know this by now. They're taking lorazepam. This drug works to reduce anxiety by binding to its receptor, opening these channels. What would we say? Hopefully you would say chloride. If not, I'm going to go cry in my sock drawer now. Have a nice night, everybody.